Hi everybody, welcome back to the Orbitum Tribe. I'm your host and creator of this podcast, Mignon. <laughs> please like, please subscribe, please share this with people you know, people you don't know, people you like, people you don't like. It doesn't matter. Good news is good news. I would like to talk about dating because, you know, it just seems to be like a, something that you can't get away from. My YouTube algorithm is all how to get him to love you, how to get him to respect you, how to live a soft life, how to make him obsessed with you. And I'm like, you watch one dating advice video and now, you know, and I don't, Y'all, I'm at the place in my life now where I just don't care. If you don't respect me, that's on you. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to get nobody to do anything, okay? You either going to do it or you're not. All right? What's one thing I will give myself credit for? I'm not trying to change you, boo. I don't want to train nobody. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm tired. I'm working on myself. I do not want to do the emotional labor of turning you into a better man. I want you to do that for yourself and for your love of God. If you don't have a growth mindset, it's not for me. If you don't have a growth mindset, I don't think you should be in a relationship. I just don't. But I want to talk about something that's a little bit different. Um, I saw, I can't remember the guy's name but I want to listen to him talk about everything. But basically he was just talking about how there are more single men than ever. There are more single people than ever. Um, Just the numbers have flipped between men and women as far as like single women owning homes more than single men. Uh, You know, back in the seventies, I think only 20% of women made more than their husbands or 10, maybe six. I can't remember the number, but now it's 50%. Now it's half and half. And the way he, uh, he describes something called the high heel effect, how women, we out graduate men, we're starting to out earn men and how over the decades, women are metaphorically getting taller than men. And the reason why they use that uh, metaphor is because men typically, well, women typically don't want to date men that are shorter than them. And that's, I guess, across the board, right? And um, it's just funny when you look at the comments on some of the videos, all dudes keep saying the same thing. And so it means all the girls are dating the same dudes and they don't even realize it. And my only thing is, why is that your comment? Why isn't your comment like, dang. I need to get my weight up instead of (laughs) they're all dating the same guy. Like, and it kind of proves his point. Like we've stopped investing in the middle class. And so there is just the decline of men and uh, the family unit. And basically he was saying statistics show when men aren't in relationships, some of y'all are not going to like this. Um, They just become worse citizens. They're more likely to commit crimes and they're more likely to commit violent crimes. But married men spend less money. Married men are happier. Married men are um, more responsible citizens. So basically, in so many words, (laughs) women, our lives have been getting better uh, in a particular front. But men have not been. There's been kind of a stunt to their growth. But. He wasn't saying it's because there's something inherently wrong with men. So please hear me on this. What he is saying the culprit is, is that America is no longer bolstering the middle class. There are more losers being created by the disparity and the distribution of wealth. Um, When America was at its strongest, I guess, family wise, um, there was just a strong middle class. Um, creating more highways, creating more jobs for men. Um, They cut the child tax credit. And so now it's a deterrent to have a child. Um, Owning a home is so expensive. And, but I guess recently they gave senior citizens like a really big 
credit to for retirement, which I think is good. We need to take care of our aging population because now more than ever, there are more people living longer. So we do need to take care of our elderly. But why is it in our society, especially in America, in order for one group to win, another group has to lose? And that's the myth of scarcity. And scarcity is one of the issues with dating right now. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. But what I really want to think about, talk about is like the spiritual perspective. Surprise, surprise. And I want to talk about archetypes. And these archetypes apply to any gender. Um, there's the Delilah archetype, the Jezebel archetype, and the Bathsheba archetype, and the Abigail slash Zipporah archetype. So Delilah is a woman who was a prostitute. She was Samson's prostitute of choice. She was also a Philistine woman. So she was an enemy of, <laughs> she was a part of the uh, cultural group that was the enemy of the Israelites. And she was a prostitute. Mind you, Samson was not only a Levite, he was a Nazarite. Nazarites never cut their hair. They never drank wine. They, so Levites lived a very strict life compared to the rest of Israel, right? But a Nazarite lived the strictest. Like the Nazarite vow was pretty intense. And so, but Samson though, he always had a weakness for these foreign women, okay? When he first got married, he wanted this Philistine woman. And his parents were like, son, is there no one in the house of Israel? And God actually told his parents, he said, do it. He said, let him marry her because I'm going to use it as an occasion to move against the enemy. I'm going to talk about this some other time, but God will even redeem your mistakes. I know God has done that in my life. So God, of course, told them not to intermarry with um a lot of the people around them because they were idol worshipers. They did a lot of evil stuff. They sacrificed their children. And God was like, I want y'all to be separate and apart because if you intermarry with them, y'all going to be out here killing your kids, sacrificing to Molech. Like I ain't got time for that. Right. But they did it anyway. So Samson being a Nazarite who's <laughs> Levites are only supposed to marry women of a Levite can't even marry another woman of the house of Israel. They can only marry another Levite. And then she's got to be a virgin. Okay. So this man not only wants <laughs> a woman who's outside of the house of Israel, he wants a Philistine outside of the house of, well, the tribe of Levi. He wants a complete and total Philistine. And God said, D do it. We, most of us know this story. Delilah over and over showed this man who he was. He did not care. And he kept going back to her. She was like, Samson, tell me where you get your strength from. And he would lie to her and laugh in her face and play in her face. And um, it's because he was so strong, right? He killed a thousand people, with a, cow a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. So, you know, he was feeling himself a little bit. So he finally tells her the truth because the Bible says that, I mean, she wearied him to death. <laughs> and... um. Each time he lied to her, the Philistines would try to bind him the way that he lied to her and it didn't work. And so he would come back to her. She would come back to him and say, you're making fun of me. You're laughing at me to my face. How come you won't tell me? And so he would just keep lying to her. And so finally, the Bible says that she wearied him to death and he tells her the truth. But what I want you to focus on, especially men because y'all listen to rap music and we have lyrics like, um, we don't love these hoes. And um, Samson actually did kind of love her. And the Bible says that when he finally told her the truth, that his strength was in never cutting his hair and she shaved his head and they bound him up. The Bible says that he said to himself, I will break free as I have always done before. Men, women, 
I think we often overestimate ourselves when it comes to the company we keep. We think that I don't see this person as my future, but I'm going to just spend time with them because I'm lonely. You know what I'm saying? You probably don't be that honest with yourself and use the word lonely, but you'll just be like, oh, you know, I just feel like talking to somebody. So I'm going to just, you know, and we think I'll, I'll break it off. But God knew what he was doing when he created sex. There are all these hormones that are released that make us feel connected to one another. It's the same hormones released when a woman is pregnant that makes her feel connected to her child because unlike the animal kingdom, certain animals, I should say, like sea turtles, they drop their kids off on the beach and never see them again. Humans aren't like that because the human infant is useless without someone taking care of it. It will die. So oxytocin is released so that we... Even though we're sleep deprived and we're tired, there's something that tells us we have to still take care of this screaming baby at 2 a.m. Same hormone is released when we're having sex, even with a complete and total stranger, even with a Delilah. And we think that, oh, I'll break free. I'll, I'll leave. And then next thing you know, you're having a baby with someone you never want to see again ever in life. And the Delilah archetype is the person who will not only derail your destiny, they show you how much they are not for you, but because of the way they make your body feel, because of the way they make you feel, you keep going back, even though you know they are no good for you. And oftentimes it's our arrogance, like Samson, I'll break free but this feels too good to give up right now. We derail ourselves in our destiny because we are slaves to our flesh and our carnality and feeling good. So that's the Delilah archetype. This person is not for you, man or woman. They are not for you. They have shown you, but there's something about them that, you know, just has their hooks in you. And you think that you can break free when after all you are in tar. And in case you don't know the end of Samson's story, God, his hair does grow back. Oh, oh. There's a scripture in his story where they, um, they gouge his eyes out and they turn him into a slave and they make him grind in the, in the mill. And so the Bible tells us that, but then there's a scripture that says, and his hair starts to grow back. Child of God, know this. You might have let this person shave your hair off and you might have let them get under your skin and maybe there are some irreversible mistakes that you've made. But know this, your hair will grow back. God will redeem it. But Samson, poor guy, he prays to God. He said, Lord, return my strength and let me destroy the Philistines as I did and uh, let me die with them. And that's what happens. He destroys more Philistines leaders in Uh, one fail swoop than he ever did in his life, but he died with them. So be careful with Delilah's, okay? Your hair will grow back, but the eyes not growing back. His eyes was gouged out. So that's the Delilah archetype, Jezebel archetype. Jezebel was married to King Ahab, and Ahab was out here bad, y'all. I don't even know. I don't know if Ahab even worshiped God like that. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I mean, he knew about God because of the prophets at the time. But I mean, they say, I mean, the Bible says Ahab was pretty bad off. Sorry if y'all can hear my dog entertaining himself right now. He's the child of a middle child. So he is having a ball. So if you can hear it, you know, hey, what am I going to do? Um, at any rate, Ahab, he's married to Jezebel. Jezebel is a straight up witch idol worshiper and she she actually loves Ahab she just doesn't want Ahab to love God Jezebel is pretty self-explanatory we don't have to spend a lot of time here this is the person who really loves you y'all are codependent Ahab and Jezebel were codependent when Ahab had an attitude and his feelings was hurt because somebody wouldn't sell him a field (laughs) she's like baby I'm gonna get you this field and it's, it's bad, y'all. The man, the person who owns the field dies. Of course, she's a witch. 
However, she is for Ahab. She just doesn't want Ahab to be for God and serve his gods. So this is the person who doesn't want you to go to church on Sunday. This is the person who's like, but aren't we going to brunch? You know, aren't we, aren't we, um, I, babe, why don't you just, why don't we just meditate? You know, you don't, you don't really need to go to church, right? Um, this is the person who doesn't necessarily, uh, want you worshiping God. They don't want you being accountable and bending the knee to Christ. So we don't have to spend a lot of time on Jezebel. Jezebels are typically pretty obvious, but then again, maybe not. Delilahs are trickier because Delilahs you think you can break free from and they just want you to serve them. So this person says, yeah, go to church, but you coming over after, right? And y'all gonna, y'all gonna do whatever y'all want. You're gonna do it. <laughs> y'all gonna do anything but follow the commandments of God. So this Delilah doesn't care you go to church. Delilah just wants you to serve her, right? The whole point was the reason why she was selling uh, Samson out was because they promised her a lot of money. So Delilah's are just these really selfish narcissists that just they don't care. So, oh yeah, sure, go to church. Just make sure you also worship at my altar. Jezebel is someone who's like, nah, like what you need that for? You got me. And that's essentially how Jezebel was with Ahab. She was, you know, henpecking Ahab and um, going to war with Elijah. And this girl was so bad that she put Elijah on the run after Elijah had just had a really great victory for God. But he knew how bad this woman was. But he was tired, I think. He was like, why am I still dealing with this woman? Um, I don't think he was really afraid of her. I think he was just tired. He was tired of fighting. And um, Jezebels will wear you down. So we don't have to stay there. Watch out for the Jezebels. This person is trying to completely turn you away from God. Whereas Delilah will turn you away from God and derail your destiny. Jezebels want to fix your eyes on a different God altogether. Now Bathsheba's. Those y'all have, some of y'all are like, I'm obviously not going to mess with a Jezebel. I'm obviously not going to mess with a Delilah. But a lot of y'all, a lot of us are most, we mess with Bathsheba's because if you notice, the Bible doesn't say that Bathsheba was a wicked woman. It doesn't. The Bible doesn't say that she was evil. The Bible doesn't say she was bad. She was just bad for David. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. And I think that's what happens with a lot of us. We choose someone because they're good on paper and they're not good for us. And the key to all of this is purpose and destiny. And the reason why I think a lot of people get with Bathsheba's is because like I said, Bathsheba wasn't a wicked woman. Obviously, it was wrong at that time because she was married. So David, of course, knew not to mess with her. But I feel like, especially with men, men like Bathsheba's so much, not necessarily other people's girls or other people's wives, literally, because they're already married. But I feel like men especially like Bathsheba's because they look good. When they're technically destined to be with someone else, but because this woman looks good, you must have her. And Bathsheba didn't completely derail David's destiny, but there was spiritual warfare he had to deal with. And not just spiritual. If you know the story of David, he had to deal with actual warfare, his actual son tried to kill him and take his throne. So ladies and gentlemen, if you end up with a Bathsheba, someone who's good on paper, but not good for you, you will deal with unnecessary spiritual warfare simply because you don't know the difference between a good pick and a God pick. 
And the only way to know that is if you know who you are and you know your destiny, because it's not going to be as obvious as the actual David and Bathsheba situation. She was married. He knew that was wrong. Right. But I think what's tricky about today's society is that, you know, this guy or this girl isn't necessarily married or in a relationship. But they look good on paper and it's like, I want them. I must have them. I will have them. And you don't really ask God if this is good for you. But I feel like because God is merciful, there's something in you that knows that this is not a good fit. It's kind of like when I was talking about how you need to love yourself and that person comes along that's closest to what you've wanted. Like say, like we, I was using this salad analogy and this is a, this person's a salad, but it's not really the salad you want. You know, you might want a garden salad, but this person's a Caesar and you know, it's not quite right, but it's good to you and you don't know how to give it up. And so those are the three archetypes that will, well, two of them will completely derail your destiny. God can't redeem anything though. One of them will give you unnecessary spiritual warfare because they're good. They're just not good for you, right? Now, Abigail, Zipporah. I love this story because I feel like it's so revelatory of what I was talking about in my last podcast about the lies that we believe about ourselves. So I'm going to take a little time here. David, we know he was called by God to be the next king of Israel. His dad had to be asked multiple times, are these all your kids? So you can imagine that David probably had a, a father wound, right? That invalidation, uh, feeling unseen, uh, not feeling like he belonged. And so... And he took care of his father's sheep. He protected them from lions, bears. Like the Bible talks about how he, he said, yo, I've killed a lion and I've killed a bear and I'm but a youth. So David was killing lions and bears when he was a, a kid. By this time, David is full grown at this part of his life where he's on the run from Saul. He and his men are uh, taking care of. They're just in these, this, and I don't think they're in the wilderness. I can't remember the term the Bible used, but basically he was in this specific area of Israel and this rich man had all this land and he had all this pasture and he had these sheep and it was a feast. There was a, a feast and David didn't have any food for his men because he's on the run. So David sends a word to this rich man. His name was Nabal. And he says, Hey, you know, we haven't taken anything from your herdsmen and your shepherd, your shepherds. Um, as a matter of fact, we protected them from people who would harm them. Um, and we haven't asked of anything, but my men are hungry and this feast is coming up. You know, will you please as a courtesy, you know, you know, feed us. Nabal, his name means fool. He says, how many followers you got? I heard of no David. You on IG? <laughs> uh, who are you? Completely insults David. Now, mind you, David was a, a shepherd. He took care of his father's sheep. And when Samuel came to Jesse's house, David's dad, Jesse didn't think enough of David to call his name, even though he's out there killing lions and bears. Here we are, taking care of sheep, taking care of people, protecting people. And when he asked this man for help, he spits in David's face. I don't think in that moment, it was about David being disrespected by this man. I think all the years of invalidation, because also notice this, Jesse doesn't see David. And then Saul turns on David. You know, at one point before Saul turns on David, he calls him his son. So imagine how David felt like, wow, I'm finally being seen by a father figure. And then this father figure is now hunting him like a dog. Those are David's words. So you have my actual father who invalidates me and doesn't see me. And then the man who I saved Israel for, right? I killed this Philistine giant. Now he's hunting me down and trying to kill me. And here's this man I'm helping. He didn't even ask for my help. I'm protecting his herdmen, his herdsmen, his sheep, and I need help. 
and he won't help me. So I think at that time in David's life, he was just tired. He was t- that unco that that um those core needs not being met. Also, like in the last podcast, the lies that we believe about ourselves because those un those core needs not being met. I don't know what I'm trying to say with this unneed, but anyway, um, I, oh, that's what I'm trying to say, unmet needs. And so I think it was just built up because he's on the run. He's begging for food, right? His, his core needs, his, first of all, his core needs aren't being met, but his basic needs, right? Food, shelter, clothing. He doesn't have food. And here he is trying to protect somebody else's sheep and hasn't asked anything, hasn't taken anything when he could have. He was a mighty warrior, right? And this man disrespects him. And at this point in David's life, he's tired of being disrespected by people who that he helps, by people he bends over backwards for. Why does no one see me? You know, you can see some of his discouragement in his Psalms and probably some of the lies he's believed about himself. But the cool thing about David, he knew the word of God. So he would do his, he would cry, but then he would, you know, flip it back on the goodness of God. And that's what you got to do. And the Bible says that, you know, he said, you know, I will encourage myself. The Bible says that David encouraged himself, but at this point he didn't encourage himself. So Nabal sends word back to David, like, basically, who are you? You're nobody. I'm not helping you. David's tired, right? David says, I'll tell you who I am. By this time tomorrow, If everybody in your house isn't dead, may, may it be unto me. Basically said, if I don't kill you, I better be dead tomorrow. If you not dead tomorrow and everybody in your house, I'm going to be dead. And so, (laughs) and back then, and so he was a rich guy. So that didn't mean like, Nabal, his wife and his kids, that meant his servants, his employees. He said, everything that pisses against the wall, excuse my French, will be dead. Okay. That's who I am. You're going to find out. Okay. David's on his way. Nabal's servants, they don't even go to him. They go to his wife, Abigail. This is my uh, last archetype. archetype. They go to Abigail and they say, yo, you know, your husband is wild. And uh, the mighty warrior David is on his way to kill everybody because Nabal disrespected him. We gonna die. He asked for food. He didn't help him. Girl, what we gonna do? She said, listen, kill, kill some goats, get some raisins, get some cakes, and we gonna go, right? She, on David's way, <laughs> on David's way to, you know, destroy Nabal in his house, Abigail meets him with the provisions. And she's like, forgive my Lord. His name means fool. This is my husband. Here's the food. Please, 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 please have mercy on us. So on and so forth. And David says to her, you have been more righteous than I today. And you have kept me from sinning against the Lord and, you know, destroying my destiny. Now, interlude. Nabal gets word that David is on his way to kill everybody, to spray the whole place. Nabal has what is essentially a stroke or a heart attack. I think maybe even both, because the Bible says his heart died within him. We'll go with heart attack. I think it was heart attack and stroke. And then eventually he dies after his heart dies within him. And so after the mourning period, David sends word to Abigail and is like, hey, you trying to marry me or whatever? She said, yup. And so she becomes one of David's wives. And so why is Abigail an archetype? David says to her, you have kept me from sinning and destroying my destiny. I'm paraphrasing, of course. So if you do not marry Abigail, real quick, we'll also go into Zipporah. David calls, I mean, David, God calls Moses. Moses is like, no, 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 I don't talk good. And eventually Moses agrees because God says, all right, I'll let Aaron speak, 
you'll be like me and then Aaron will be like you. So fine. God gives him some concessions. But Moses and Sapporah have a son. It's the eighth day. He doesn't circumcise his son for whatever reason. He's probably preoccupied like, okay, I got to go to Egypt. I got to talk to this Pharaoh. This Pharaoh is crazy, dog. I mean, I killed somebody. They're going to try to throw me in jail. So Moses is probably preoccupied and forgets. I'm just going to assume. Zipporah grabs a flint knife, circumcises their son, and she's like, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. And then, oh, key, key part of the story Moses forgets to circumcise their son. I'm saying forgets. This is an inference. The Bible says he didn't. Moses doesn't circumcise their son. And the God, the Bible says that God was wroth, right? Angry with Moses and ready to kill him. Now, mind you, a chapter before, God is going back and forth with this man saying, you are chosen to go and deliver my people. And then the next chapter, God is ready to kill this person. What does that tell you? A, God don't need you, even if you are Moses. That's number one. Number two, no one is above reproach. Nobody is, you know, you have to have obedience when you're working with God. He, his patience is long, but every once in a while, he's not playing with y'all, okay? When I say y'all, I mean us, <laughs> okay? So... Zippor grabs the flint knife and circumcises their son, says, you're a bridegroom of blood, key part of the story. And then the Bible says that God, God's wrath relented against Moses and he didn't kill him. What is the commonality with Zipporah and Abigail? Both of these women saved the lives and the destiny of their husbands. Abigail wasn't even married to David. And David was like, yo, you, you saved me from destroying my future. You've kept me from sinning this day, right? Zipporah was already married to Moses. Zipporah wasn't even an Israelite. And she knew to circumcise their son, right? Because circumcision is the, is the symbol of the covenant between Israel and God. Um, you got to find Tim Ross talking about how the metaphor of circumcision and our hearts and our lives um, and our relationship with God, it's, it's really good. It's really good. Um, and so that was really important to God. If you do not end up with a Zipporah or an Abigail archetype, you will inevitably have a blind spot. You will ev- inevitably fail God. But if you have a Zipporah husband, an Abigail husband, an Abigail wife, a Zipporah wife, this person will stand in the gap for me, for you. This person will stand in the gap for you, pray for you, intercede for you, and probably be the thing that saves you from destroying yourself. We all need help. I mean, is that not what Christ is? Our forerunner, right? the propitiation for our mistakes. But we need someone to stand in the gap. And it's so important for you to pick a spouse and not waste your time dating. Because that's the thing. A lot of us know that this person isn't our destiny, right? Like with Delilah. I'm going to fool around with them because this person does fun things to my body. And then you fool around and you get your eyes gouged out because you're too impatient to wait for the Abigail or the Zipporah. Your spouse will be the thing that sanctifies you, especially if you're like, if you got an unbelieving spouse and you're a believer, you sanctify the unbelieving spouse. It is so important who you end up with and why destiny purpose. Moses was the deliverer of the people of Israel. David was the shepherd of Israel. And the greatest David, Jesus comes from the lineage of David. Most of the Psalms are written by David. And Abigail, if if there was no Abigail, will we have the Psalms we have today? Would, would Jesus have come from the lineage of David?
if we if we didn't have Zipporah, who would have delivered the people of Israel? Would they have been in bondage for another hundred years until God saw a person fit to be a deliverer? So who you end up with is not only important for you and your life and your destiny, but the people connected to your destiny. The million, I think it was what, a million people at the time that were enslaved by the Egyptians, a million people were counting on Moses and didn't know it. Think about all the people that are connected to your destiny. And if you pick wrong, think about all the people who won't be delivered from whatever it is that they need to be delivered from, that God chose you to do. Whatever it is God chose you to do, if you don't end up doing it because you fooling around with it, that male version of Delilah, that Jezebel, or worse, now I'm not going to say worse because Bathsheba didn't destroy David's destiny. And first of all, it's not even Bathsheba's fault. David knew better. I mean, she did too. But think about how much power did a woman have in that day? And he was the king and he was a stone. Like he was a cold-blooded killer. I'm not saying he would have hit her or nothing like that. But she was probably a little bit scared. And there was clearly a hierarchy of power. Even if David wasn't a warrior, he's still king. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, women didn't have a lot of power back then. Now, yes, because she stood on business and be like, no, my Lord, we can't do this. You're king of Israel. We can't. uh," Like, yeah, sure. But let's keep it real. David was probably fine, y'all. I mean, the women were singing songs about him. And he was shorter than Saul. And they were still singing songs about David instead of Saul. He danced naked in front of all the women. That's why his first wife had an attitude. Uh, Saul's daughter, Michal. Yeah, she had an attitude because he got naked and was dancing because he was so excited about what God is. He wasn't trying to impress the ladies. But I mean, she was like, oh, I'm sure the maidens of Israel love seeing you dance. And he was like, you know what? I ain't dealing with you no more. Sidebar. So there are people who are counting on you. You have a destiny. You have a purpose. I'm not going to tell you that it's as big as Moses is and you're supposed to deliver a million people from bondage. It could be as simple as you are the math teacher to the future physicist that develops clean energy that keeps the world from going past global boiling. Cause right now we're in global boiling. We're past global warming. We are in global boiling. What if there's a way to reverse it? I know scientists say there isn't, but what if you're going to be the math teacher to a little boy or a little girl who doesn't come from a family of scientists, they might even come from a broken home, but you believe in that child and that child grows up to be the physicist that turns our global boiling situation around. Who says that's not important? You know, when Jesus came into Jerusalem the week before his crucifixion, and, you know, we call it Palm Sunday because they laid the palm trees before him. Think about being the person who had the donkey, like when his disciples said, hey, the Lord is in need of this donkey. That could be your, like, you're the person who had the donkey that the Lord rode on. You couldn't tell me nothing. Yeah, I'd be like, yeah, that's my donkey Jesus was riding on. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Jesus is what to use my donkey. You know, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool. No, I, I ain't bragging. I ain't. You know, we all have a purpose to fulfill. And it's so important that you don't end up with someone who will rob you of your purpose or derail it, or in the case of Bathsheba, give you spiritual warfare that you weren't even supposed to have. You weren't even supposed to have that. That's what God said to David. He said, what have I not given you? And if it weren't enough, I would have gave you more. Now, because of this, the sword will never depart from your house. I guess I didn't tell y'all that in case you don't know the story of David. 
But God literally says, because of this, the sword will never depart from your house. David could have been at peace his final years, but he had to have that Bathsheba. He sure did. But God will redeem because the next king of Israel is Solomon, David's son, who is his mother, Bathsheba. I love that about God. God, like he will give us consequences for our mistakes, but he'll he'll then turn around and use the mistake for his glory. It's so good to me. Out of all, he didn't even use Abigail's children. That wasn't even the son or daughter. Well, son, I mean, come on, let's keep it real. It was patriarchy back then. He wouldn't use, not there's anything wrong with that, um, with the way God set it up. Um, well, when we think about the kings of Israel, God didn't even want Israel to have kings. So that's something worth exploring. I'm not saying it's wrong that, you know, the lineage passed on to the sons, but it's worth considering because back when they had judges, women were judges. The way God had it, women were judges like Deborah. And that's, I'm, I'm just saying. Um, but God took the mistake of, you know, Bathsheba being, becoming David's wife, because of course David had Uriah killed. So now she's a widow, so he can marry her, but he was never supposed to marry her, but God redeemed it. So God can redeem your mistakes. Like say, you know, you didn't got yourself entangled with a little male Jezebel. First of all, if you entangle with the Jezebel, or Delilah, I need you to get out of there, especially Jezebel. Notice that the only one of those situations that weren't redeemed was Ahab. He was too far gone. Ahab didn't repent, right? Did Ahab repent? I can't remember if Ahab repented. I don't think he did. Um, I know that there, there were a couple of kings of Israel that were idol worshipers that did end up repenting, but I don't think Ahab did. Um, I could be wrong though. Y'all let me know in the comments if Ahab was one of the kings that repented. But from what I understand, if, if I'm remembering correctly, God's spirit returned to Samson. He died in the process, but he ended well enough. David did end well. He dealt with stuff he didn't have to deal with, you know, lost sons that he didn't have to lose. That's the other thing. Fooling around with the wrong person will destroy your future. Your children are your future. They're your descendants. And if you fool around with the wrong person, the wrong person can kill parts of your future. Sons were dead because of David's mistake. Don't mess with the wrong person. Find your Abigail, your Zipporah, the person who will keep you on track for your destiny and who will get you to see, oh, I've sinned this day. Hold you accountable. But I think, you know, we don't have to worry as much about messing with Delilah's or Jezebel's if you're at a certain level of spiritual maturity. It's, we got to watch out for the, Bath the Bathsheba decision, especially as ladies, because like I was saying at the beginning, single men are, they're not even trying to date. And I mean, you know, and the statistics show that a lot of it is because of porn, but also it's because they just feel inadequate financially and they just feel inadequate in general. Um, and us ladies, because there's so few viable options, we might get a Bathsheba situation. We might find ourselves with a dude who is not a destiny pick and, now you fight in spiritual warfare that God never even intended for you, but you didn't want to be single no more. So don't do it, sis. Don't do it. Don't do it, bro. Because men especially, you know, the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Friend, if you, brother, marrying the wrong woman, Look at Ahab. Look at Solomon. The Bible says that all of Solomon's foreign wives turned his heart from the Lord. Men might not like to admit it because we got these lyrics in these rap songs talking about we don't love these hoes, but you do. You do. 
y'all like some strange. I don't know what it is about y'all, but y'all like some strange and they, they turn your hearts from the Lord. That's my talk on dating archetypes. Please like and subscribe. Please be patient and wait on God. Most importantly, find out why God sent you here. And you won't be so focused on dating. Yeah, it gets lonely. That's fine. That's good. But if you, I promise you, it's like Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of the one who sent me. He knew his purpose at 12, right? When he stayed back during that feast and um, gave Mary and Joseph a fright. And he said, did you not know I had to be about my father's business? Well, ladies, gentlemen, be about your father's business and the Delilah's and the Jezebel's um, and the Bathsheba's can't distract you. Your meat, your bread, your sustenance will be fulfilling your purpose and your calling. And I promise you, everyone that's supposed to walk alongside you, your paths will intersect, your paths will cross. It might take a while, but it will. I believe that. I believe that. I believe that God is a reward of those who diligently seek him. I believe that um, God understands how much we need one another, i.e. Abigail and Zipporah literally saving destinies. We can save each other's destinies. We can stand in the gap for one another. And I think God knows that we need that sometimes. So I believe he'll provide it. But you got to ask God what he wants you to do and you can focus on that and you cannot turn to the right or to the left, but walk that straight now. So stay tuned, y'all. Like, subscribe, share, comment. Uh, let me know, um, you know, what you'd like us to go over. And um, until next time.